Again, my name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York, which is the Eastern time zone. So for me, it is 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, I always mention where I'm located just so that you know if you have to convert your time, you know that you can use Philadelphia or New York to do your conversions. When we're not traveling virtually, I host groups on physical tours, as well as help others plan their own family and group vacations. So if you're looking to get back out there, don't hesitate to reach out to me so that I can help you get there. Don't let the name Girl Travel Tours fool you. We welcome everyone on our tours, not just girls. The name came about because I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, but now I lead tours for, eight, for ages teens through senior citizens with many of my tours being adult only tours. But when COVID struck, we were unable to travel physically. So I started traveling with my tour guide friends virtually. I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restrictions where they were not able to work. And I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and also extend that opportunity to those of you who've learned about us and our tours through family, friends, and social media. And thankfully, these virtual tour presentations have served both purposes quite well. We've done more than 75 tours since the uh, beginning of COVID. We have all of the tours up on my website and my YouTube channel and Facebook for you to see the recording. And recently this weekend, we rejiggered the website a little bit, making it easier for people to find the tours. I added a search mechanism and I also categorized them in region so that you can go and look at a certain region and see all of the virtual tours in that region. I hope that you find it easier to navigate. If you have any feedback, please let me know. I'm always trying to improve the user experience. So just let me know how things are going for you and I'd be happy to make more improvements as we go along. We have several more tours planned um, in the coming months and I have added many to our uh, page on my website so that you can register. I'm gonna put them up so that you can see them. Uh, we are going to Marche, Italy in, uh, on February 22nd. We're going to go um, to Slovenia in March, the Cayman Islands. Then we're going to go over to Italy for Cuomo and the Lake region. Around Easter and Passover, we're going to go back to the Holy Land and um, get an update on what goes on uh, in both of those <clears throat> in the springtime during that time frame. And then, on the, unfortunately, I had to reschedule the Madrid tour, which was scheduled for March, but we had to move it back until May because the tour director um, had a recent conflict. So we did have to move that around. So if you are signed up for that tour, you will get a notice that, the, um, that it was postponed to a later date. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them for you. And I wanna review a few ways for you to interact with us. Feel free to ask questions about the tour, the tour director and my travel program by using the Q&A link on the Zoom toolbar. Those questions will be read and addressed at the end of the presentation. If you are just looking to chat with me, you can do that over the chat mechanism in Zoom, or obviously put your comments through on Facebook and interact with us that way. And as you always um, know, if you've been with us for these tours in the past, um, I want to throw up a poll because I think it's always fun to see where people are in terms of their connection to this region. Uh, so the question is, what's your connection to the Canyon country in the United States of America? I have been and I love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location and I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. So if you do not have a trip booked and I see a lot of you plan to go in the future and you have no, um, and you have no set plans, but you're interested, join us. We have a great group forming and um, we plan to, to 
travel. Our departure date is May 17th. It's a great way to start traveling again, utilizing your own country and not having to navigate the international requirements. Um, so think about it if you, if you love this virtual tour. Anyway, I'm going to end the poll. We're going to view it and see what the results were. And my screen is stuck, but hopefully you guys all see this. Um, about 43% of you have, have been and loved it. Uh, very small percent have a trip booked right now, 4%, but there's a pretty large percentage, uh, 46 total that either plan to go in the future or are interested in the location. And then thank you all uh, who just come virtually to experience these tours. We welcome you back week after week. So I'm gonna stop sharing. If your screen is still apparent in front of you, just go and click off the top um, button on the top left and that should get out of the viewing for you so that you see the slide again. Okay, so I'm excited. I am, as I said, I'm excited to offer this virtual tour presentation. And if you're interested in um, knowing about what we do here, each of our tours are slotted for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So um, please feel free to make sure that you're ready with a drink or a snack in hand. And as you well know, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. And we have back our American National Parks special guide, Ashia. She recently brought us a virtual tour of Yellowstone. And today she will be exploring Canyon Country with all of us. I'll share via the chat and during the Q&A how you can tip the tour guide. If you appreciate the presentation and our guide's knowledge, all of the tips go directly to the guide once collected minus the Zoom operating expenses. So today I wanna welcome Ashia. Um, Ashia, if you are ready, you can join us and turn on your video and turn um, on your sound and I'll say hello to you and then I'll hand over the presentation. So when you're ready, um, come on and join us. How are you doing, Ashia? It's always nice. Thanks, to see Mara. You I know, wonderful to see you and um, people from it sounds like um, around the world, which is so exciting. And am I coming through fairly clearly? You're awesome. Yep. Okay, okay. terrific. Well, I'm going to um, set up some settings here and Mara, just keep me posted if it looks good. Absolutely. Um, I am so excited and um, really honored to be here with all of you. Um, there's a, a deep love in my heart um, for this canyon country. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, take a wander across canyon country. And I know some of you are signed up for Mara's in-person tour in May. Um, if you're not and you like what you see, um, I think she's going to be hitting some fabulous sites. Um, I would not recommend this trip necessarily uh, that we're going to take today over the course of the next little over an hour. Um, all in one trip because there are so many amazing, incredible, uh, incredible and powerful spots to see. Uh, but that's me down there, Ashia Mills, Walking Shadow Ecology Tours of Yellowstone. Um, I actually am just about 100 yards from the boundary, the north boundary of Yellowstone in Gardner, Montana. Um, and uh, if questions don't get answered or you want to connect, that's my email address, um, my website and email address, info at yellowstone.education, all spelled out. Um, but I am actually from, uh, from uh, I'm excited to go on a road trip, and that's what I do often, um, heading back down home to my uh, original hometown in Williams, Arizona. And um, if you take a look at that mountain, that's Bill Williams Mountain, uh, just about an hour south of the south rim of the Grand Canyon, you can see some towers up there. And um, my dad was a fire tower look up, uh, lookout up there for a number of years growing up. That's he with my daughter more recently um, going up and visiting the old homestead. It looks a lot different than when it did when I was a kid, um, but a great view of that Northern Arizona landscape. And that's what we did was went and explored. And uh, if you could see out into the haze in this picture up there, you would see the North Rim, even though we're an hour south of the South Rim from this image, the north rim of the Grand Canyon is about a thousand feet higher, so you could see it pretty well um, in that little lookout tower. Um, Williams is home to the Grand Canyon Railway, so that's a fun way to approach the canyon. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna we're gonna go on a wild journey. Um, there's a lot of places to visit, and I will be 
um, kind of flipping through some different slides, but just to orient us into some space, um, you can see that map of the US. The Colorado Plateau is a huge, huge geographic area. It's about 150,000 square miles. And um, notice that I put a little plus sign. Um, that marks the four corners of where the four states, which are Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico meet. We're actually gonna pop into that little spot there in a bit. Um, but on any of the maps that I show you, that's a bit of orientation I've included. I've sort of hand drew or uh, computer drew in that, that uh, little plus sign there right at four corners just to help keep us a bit oriented. Um, and the Colorado Plateau is so diverse. Um, it ranges from the bottom of the Grand Canyon and at 2,000 feet on up to the, some of the highest points, uh, almost 13,000 feet. So um, forgive my mouse here. We're going to actually start up here in uh, uh, Bryce and Zion up in this part of the, the area. We're going to swing across southern Utah, hitting some different sites and viewpoints here. We're going to arc up north towards Arches and some state uh, state parks up this way wrap our way back down, talking a lot about culture and um, uh, moving across this landscape mindfully. We're gonna swing over uh, to Chaco Canyon, Canada de Che, across the Navajo Nation and over to the Grand Canyon, uh, which is um, really, uh, I feel like part of where my, my cells were born um, out, of these, out of these landscapes. So I'm really honored to be able to share them with you. Um, before we head in, um, I wanted to point out on this last map, you can see some of the different tribal lands there as well. Um, and everywhere that we go, we are on uh, indigenous lands. And so I do want to give a, a lands acknowledgement and, and just notice and gratefully acknowledge that we are traveling in the traditional homelands of the many indigenous people who call the Colorado Plateau and Four Corners area home. Um, it's in their territory that we travel. And um, we want to do that with respect and gratitude to the people for their connection to and care for this landscape. Um, we honor the history that unites us and um, seek to look forward with an open heart. And um, this is a fairly comprehensive list of the people who have been calling this landscape home for uh, thousands and thousands of years. Um, the evidence of the ancient people are all around us um, when you're on the plateau, whether it's rock art, uh, honoring some of the animals that are still here today, um, the, the bear clan, perhaps uh, bighorn sheep, which is one of the larger mammals that you'll see around the plateau. Um, and so as we move through this landscape, um, just making sure that we are uh, uh, noticing the homes that have been here all along, some modest, some more modest, and some um, gigantic cities out there. And uh, um, one of our leave no trace ethics is um, to leave what you find. And I'll mention these leave no trace ethics anytime that we're traveling um, or just existing out there, even the walk through our local woods, um, being mindful about it and, and uh, trying our best, especially with growing visitation to not leave an impact. And these little pottery shards that you can find around are so tempting to want to take with you, uh, but we ask that you leave them lay. Um, they hold a lot more power and a lot more context if we leave them where we found them. Um, and that's true of rock art as well. Um, we don't wanna to touch it. Sometimes the oils on our fingers can impact the, the art itself. Uh, we don't wanna spray water on it, that sort of thing. Um, so just entering into uh, this area with a, a, a bit of mindfulness um, and an attitude of respect and gratitude for all of the aspects of the Colorado Plateau. Um, and uh, so let's back up a little bit and talk about where we are in space. So how did we even get this, this um, incredible landscape? And there's a few uh, elements that had to come together. Um, and that includes a thick stack of stratified rock um, going back millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of layers, um, some really beautiful colors, different kinds of minerals in these types of rocks. Um, and then what happened was the Colorado Plateau, it actually used to be more of a basin. So a lot of sediment from tidal basins and uh, uh, near shore shallow oceans and um, giant deserts that lasted for millions of years layered in. And then the whole thing started buckling up during what we call the, uh, the Laramide orogeny. So the, the way that the Rocky Mountains kind of got crumpled up uh, through some plate tectonics, the Farallon plate diving under the Pacific plate, um, didn't buckle and crumble the Colorado Plateau, it just sort of pushed it up. 
uh, a little more gently. Um, we also have to have an arid climate. Um, otherwise, all of it would just wash away really quickly and then um, the presence of large rivers. Um, here's a, a cross section. So we're standing in the east looking west and you can kind of see a cross section. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show you a different view of this here, a little slightly more complicated. Um, just forgive me for geeking out on rocks for a few minutes because um, you know all of the other aspects of the plateau, the wildlife, the culture um, exist in large part because of the geology. Um, so it's kind of exciting. This is sort of an exaggerated stretched out view to be able to see those different layers. Uh, but we're gonna uh, start up at the top there at Bryce Canyon and work our way down to the, to the Grand Canyon. But think about this, when you're up at Bryce Canyon, all of those layers that are in the Grand Canyon are still below you. Um, and if you are down in the Grand Canyon, all of the layers above us going up to where Bryce Canyon is have eroded away already. So what a moving um, system this is. And uh, uh, so hang on tight, we're gonna go for a, a ride. That's my sister over here in Bryce Canyon. Um, which is a great place to start talking about this layering, uh, the sediment layering and these fantastical landscapes. Um, at different times, this, this would have been deserts, um, shallow inland seas, uh, different mineralizations that would give all these um, beautiful colors to the hoodoos. We're in the, uh, the world's concentration of hoodoos when you're in Bryce Canyon. And we're up at fairly high altitude, about 8,000 feet. So we get a lot of weather up here, rain and snow. Um, and, this, and the ice, the snow and ice in particular, is what allows that water to seep down into these fractured layers and then freeze and thaw cycles. Um, you know, ice expands, water expands. And look how porous that sandstone is. Um, you can imagine some water getting in there and expanding, and then we call it ice wedging or um, frost wedging, where it pops open these uh, these fractures. Or in the case of that rightmost slide, where you see just erosion, just a, a little probably a perennial um, water flow that that breaks through that sandstone, and gives us this these hoodoos. Um, I love the Paiute name for Bryce Canyon, Anka Kuwasowitz, and it means the um, the people with the red painted faces, and it does kind of you sort of look over your shoulder, uh, but you can see every step of these erosional processes, um, and this is true across the entire plateau. Um, and they do kind of look like characters. Um, sometimes you feel like there's a bunch of faces sort of peering around these different viewpoints. Um, some of them have some fun names too, and. Uh, no matter which way you turn, it is uh, 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 feels a little magical when you're here in Bryce Canyon. If you are able and, and you have um, the time and space for it, I always encourage getting off the road anywhere that you are um, safely and uh, with knowledge and um, planning ahead and being prepared. Uh, but getting off the, the parking lot and getting some dirt under your feet allows us to really connect and, and get a little closer with these landscapes. Um, anyone traveling with children or not, um, I always encourage a junior ranger program. That's my daughter a couple of years ago with her junior ranger program. It's a great way to um, learn a little bit more about the culture, the geology, um, maybe the wildlife. It usually offers some different ways of learning, like um, some word games or art projects, things like that. And um, just a nice opportunity to sort of ground yourself, take a shady break under a a nice juniper tree. Um, and speaking of juniper trees, um, all across the plateau, we're going to find so many different living creatures, but um, I just want to give a short honor to these matriarchs. Um, the uh, uh, What I know of dendrochronology, a tree like this could be thousands of years old. Um, it's got good drainage. It's, it's uh, kind of isolated, so bugs and diseases won't jump over to it. And so be gentle around these creatures and um, uh, give them a little bit of a birth so that so that we can uh, keep these living landscapes. Um, so now looking out, we're looking out towards the pink cliffs and we're going to drop down to the flatlands where we might see some of our one of our larger mammal species on the plateau pronghorn, not super common and only found in the grasslands. Um, these guys are uh, the fastest land mammal in North America. We have them here in Yellowstone and um, they will only be found in a place where they can jet. Um, they're not going to be in the forest. They're not going to be in that crumbly canyon land. Um, but I love this picture because he's kind of giving me this like 
kind of over the shoulder sideways plants. <laughs> uh, you keep an eye out for them um, in usually in herds down in in uh, in the in the flatlands out in the grasslands. As we head over to Zion National Park and um, Zion, we're coming in the east entrance here. Um, Zion's a really popular place with good reason. It is such a neat place to get up close and personal with these monoliths, these uh, giant sand dunes frozen in time. Um, remember this picture and you'll see some uh, kind of look up close and can you see that cross bedding? Um, the next time that you're um, at a sand dune or on the beach, just watch the way that the sand is forming in the breeze and imagine that getting cemented into place and you can literally see this from several hundred million years ago. Um, so these giant sandstone cliffs are only there because of water. So again, one of those elements of what creates the plateau in this um, form that we see it is um, the Virgin River in this case. And it looks like a fairly small creek, um, but imagine it having sliced down through thousands of feet. Um, and it can be a dangerous river. Um, any of our even small creeks can be. This was the last time we were in Zion and um, we got to watch a, a live rescue. This poor little fella got swept away. Um, it all ended well, but it was pretty exciting to watch a swift water rescue. They had a, a nice quiet moment over on the rock before they ferried him back over to our side. Um, so do be careful when you're out there. Um, but a good reminder, um, especially in these desert environments, um, I know I saw quite a few folks from back east, um, when we're out here, uh, anywhere that you are, it is so important to remember that water is life. Patuakatsi is the Hopi term for that. And uh, those are the people that have been in this landscape since the beginning of time. And it's kind of amazing out here in the desert, it could be over hundred degrees in Zion Canyon. And yet we have these beautiful uh, riparian areas, these little ponds and creeks. And listen in. That's one of my favorite sounds in the whole wide world, the canyon wren. You hardly ever see them, they're so tiny. But their sounds echo off those canyon walls and um, it cools me down literally just to, just to hear that. Because you know that water is nearby. Um, so look for these little oases, be gentle with them um, because the truth is we are in the desert um, and a lot of desert creatures. We've got over 20 species of lizards on the Colorado Plateau. Um, there's so much fun to see. There's 16 of them just in Zion. And um, look, at, look at that plated armor. Doesn't this just look like a, a miniature dinosaur? It's basically what they are. These um, throwbacks from ancient, ancient times, these resilient reptiles and um, oh, different. Look at the iridescence on that guy's back. Isn't that cool? Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool to watch them just sunning themselves on the rocks, maybe doing push-ups and looking into that ancient earth when you see these guys scampering around on the sandstone walls or potentially being part of the food chain. Um, this is a northern shrike who, um, they're kind of brutal. Um, they're known as a butcher bird and they'll snag a bird or a mouse or a, a lizard and they'll impale it on a, a thorn or a, a piece of barbed wire or something and then eat it. Um, so they're, they're not very common, but I thought that was a fun picture to, to throw in thinking about that cycle of life. Um, and then of course we do have other types of birds and we'll talk some more about that down the road, but in Zion Canyon in particular, I just love these flocks of turkey uh, that wander around. And uh, another one of our leave no trace ethics is to respect the wildlife. So of course, just let them do what they're doing. Uh, but they're really fun and social birds. Um, other things that you probably won't see, but maybe evidence of things like porcupine, look for um, where they've pulled back the bark on some of the trees to eat that cambium. Um, Ringtail cats, I've only seen one in my whole life. It ran across the road in front of me in arches one late night after dark. Uh, but evidence thereof, you can see a ringtail print in a little sandy wash where it was moist and left a nice impression. So think about the things that we don't see, mountain lions, um, bobcats, desert bighorn sheep, it's real possible to find, um, certainly in Zion, uh, particularly on that East Road um, or in the Grand Canyon. And um, uh, these guys, you can notice on that leftmost one, there's a collar. 
um, you know, this is a story of our public lands where we've changed our minds a lot about what we value. Um, Bighorn sheep were just about wiped out in, in the Zion area. And then we had a recovery program in the 1970s. Um, and they've done so well that now there's some concern about expanding ranges out into where there are domestic sheep outside the park and getting those diseases into our wild population. Um, so I, I honor the researchers and the, um, the, the scientists and the resource managers that are helping to manage these, um, these uh, uh, wild populations for us all to be able to see. Um, let's go for a quick hike. Um, Angel's Landing is one of the most popular hikes. You do have to have a permit now. Um, and, and with good reason, it can get a little crowded on these switchbacks, uh, but it's kind of cool to get off the valley floor. And there's some other hikes in Zion that you can do to, to accomplish that, but um, check out this spine that you have to navigate. So you don't want to be up there with hundreds of other people. And it, it is uh, a requirement that you have to have a permit now. So plan ahead and prepare. Uh, but it's a great hike. You're looking down about 1500 feet down to the valley floor. You can see that lush valley with the Virgin River running through it. And um, uh, uh, there's other areas. So we're looking towards Springdale, the entrance uh, little uh, boundary town. Behind us is the valley end. Um, so we have to navigate back down that spine very carefully. And that affords us a chance to slow down and um, take a look at some of the closer up details. I just love these paintbrushes that you'll see all across the Colorado Plateau, um, as well as the big views. And we discovered the last time I was there with my family, um, a fantastic way to see the canyon. So the, the canyon itself from Springdale to the end of the canyon where it dives into what we call the narrows and, and you basically are walking in the Virgin River. It might only be 20 or 30 feet wide, but thousands of feet high, those sandstone cliffs. Um, but the road system dead ends there and you have to be on a shuttle for the majority of the year, I think from like March to the end of um, the end of November or so. Um, so renting bikes either in Springdale or at the Zion Lodge and it's a closed system, just a shuttle buses going 20 miles an hour looking out for bikers. So even our littles could go and do this. And um, we just had such a blast heading down to the end of the road. And then we came back and um, returned our bikes to the Zion Lodge and did our junior ranger program uh, where we could take a moment to reflect on this um, somewhat chaotic and extraordinary landscape here in Zion Park. Um, okay, so we're going to shoot across, uh, head across the Grand Staircase uh, Escalante area, kind of heading in this direction. You can see the four corners there again. Um, uh, oops, Calf Creek Falls is fairly close to just a short hike. Um, I think it's like less than five miles uh, round trip. Um, Grand Staircase Escalante uh, was the park that almost was. They were talking at one point about taking this entire stretch of Southeast Utah and turning it into a national park. Um, and that didn't happen mostly because World War I hit. Um, and I included, um, always hit the visitor centers. It's a great place to get weather reports, trail reports, road reports, information. Um, but I do think it's interesting. Um, I wanted to point out that this particular visitor center, it's interagency, but it's BLM, Forest Service and National Park Service, no tribal representation. Um, and that's something that we are changing now, um, integrating that cultural knowledge across the board in public lands all over, um, even up here in Yellowstone and uh, throughout the National Park Service system. Um, for a sense of scale, um, take a look, that's my husband down there at the bottom of the canyon. And uh, I'm not even listing all of the places you could visit on public and tribal lands, state lands. Um, all of which are unique, every canyon wall, every slot canyon, every viewpoint has its own treasures to find. Um, and uh, these are places to enter into with knowledge, um, certainly, and a sense of the sacred. These are, are very powerful places. Um, and uh, again, with our leave no trace ethics, um, check out that log that's over my head that got jammed in there during a, a flash flood. And that's what carves these canyons. Um, so you need to always check the weather before you go into any place like this. Um, it's a little spooky sometimes being down there. Not, not good for if you're claustrophobic. Um, I've even been down there and had to 
<sighs> take a deep breath. Um, but the uh, chance to get in touch with this ancient earth history and ancient human history, these pictographs, this looks like a map that led us towards uh, perhaps a sign towards some hunting grounds. Um, we can talk a lot about the science behind how sandstone is formed. Um, but honestly, uh, just being able to get nose to nose with it and look at the crystalline granular structures of these walls. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the formation of the Colorado Plateau, but really what we're talking about is the deconstruction or the destruction of the Colorado Plateau, what wind and water and uh, erosion will do to these landscapes and leave us with these um, just really fantastical um, uh, uh, cathedrals all around us with these amazing patterns, um, getting nose to nose with that cross bedding, seeing which way the wind was blowing. Um, a, a note here, take a look at the top left part of your screen and can you see that shadow? It almost looks like an inverted um, mountain range. Um, these are so delicate, so be real gentle. These are great places to travel with um, tips on the bottom of your trekking poles. Um, a lot of these places when I was a kid were much more developed and now they've gotten sort of wiped clean from too many hands and feet. Um, not always a great place for your dogs, um, but a truly um, extraordinary place to um, experience the, the beauty um, and magic of this planet that we get to call home. Um, so let's shoot up north there, just south of Highway 70 Arches. Um, I did not include Canyonlands just because we have to make some choices here, um, but I did throw in a few slides of Goblin State Park, um, which is just south of 70, and talk about fantastical landscapes. Um, this is old tidal flats and uh, shallow inland seas that laid down these layers. Some are harder, some are softer, so that softer stuff will erode away. Um, but it is one of those places where you're kind of looking over your shoulder. Sometimes it feels like they're moving around in this magical landscape. Um, and always the presence of water, even in this dry, austere uh, desert. And that, that shape reminded me of the fact that all of this has been moist at some point um, in our history. Um, this is right up against the San Rafael Swell, which again has um, just some really neat uh, canyons and uh, vistas to explore, much more wild than a lot of the national parks. Um, they, there's not a lot of development. You're not going to eat a fancy dinner at the end of the day. Um, plan ahead and be prepared. Um, right in that neighborhood is Arches, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, Arches is where you can glance over at the LaSalle Mountains and see um, that high point that I mentioned, Mount Peel, is probably somewhere back there in those uh, in that in the snow there, uh, twelve thousand seven hundred and seventy thousand feet, um, all the way down here to the dry desert. But when you first drive into Zion, uh, or I'm sorry, into Arches, um, you're looking around wondering where the arches are. There's just this big sandstone wall, and you'll even see that as you're driving down the highway. But look in your bottom uh, part of your screen there, sort of in the center of that wall. I'll circle it for you. That's the beginning of an arch. Um, that is that that flaking off those free saw th cycles, the uh, the water having its way, and eventually we end up with these fantastic shapes. Um, much of arches is fairly accessible. Some of them, um, some of the arches you need to hike back to. Landscape arch um, is a good reminder that geology is now. This is not um, dusty textbook stuff. Um, this is actually the longest natural bridge in the US. It's, I think it's the fifth largest in the world. There's some bigger ones in China. Um, and you used to be able to walk under it, but if you look at that debris under the arch, it's gotten thinner. Um, mid 90s, there were some big slabs that fell off. Um, so they don't let you walk under it anymore. Um, and it is, it's gonna go one of these days. It might be a few more hundreds or thousands of years, but um, anywhere that you go on the plateau, uh, remember that geology is happening right before our very eyes, um, that these are not frozen in time, that the day that you see it could be totally different um, from the next day. This is, uh, I like to say, it ain't no Disneyland. This is the real deal. Um, but again, some of the arches are, are fairly accessible off of uh, boardwalks and, and shorter walkways um, and just super fun to truck around and, and uh, check out these weird and wild places. Look at the small details, look for wildflowers like this evening primrose.
that's my daughter who shows up in a lot of these photographs at different ages. So don't get disconcerted by the, the chronology um, as I was going through my photos and just wanting to pull out some of my favorites. Um, Partition Arch is an example of a, a place that you have to, you do have to get a little more off the beaten path. There's a trail to it, but um, uh, definitely not just off of the parking lot. Um, and when you do get off the road, don't forget one of our leave no trace ethics about traveling on durable surfaces. Um, take a look at that big garden sort of in the background there and know that those plants are existing and thriving because of cryptobiotic soil, crypto being hidden, biotic life, hidden life in the soil. This stuff is so cool. It just looks like kind of knobby dirt, but when you look up close, it is crusty. It's a, it's a firm to the touch. Don't touch it though. Um, but it's living creatures, little microbiotics, this uh, uh, things like um, uh, moss and uh, bacteria, lichen, it gets wet and these little microorganisms move through the soil and leave behind their casings. That's how it builds up these spicules, which helps stabilize the soil and let something like a cactus grow. Um, I, I love this picture. I took this down in Sedona, this giant boot coming out and everybody freaking out, all the little cryptobiotic spicules. Um, I've seen one that where one's holding a sign and it says like, the end is near as this giant boot is coming down. But um, it's a good reminder because it can destroy decades worth of growth. And that stabilization is critical um, out here on the Colorado Plateau. Um, I threw this in as a reminder to um, not over schedule yourself. You know, this is just literally a roadside stop just right off the side of the road. Um, it's not a big attraction. There's no entry fee. There's just a little pull out and a quick leg stretcher to run up and uh, take a breath and look around at this beautiful landscape. Um, dinosaur tracks are all over the place, especially around Moab and some on the Navajo Nation. Um, look for, I didn't even bother listing them, but um, knowing that we're walking really among these ancient creatures is kind of fun and exciting. Um, so tons of different sites, um, you know, short visits to some different places where you can see some dinosaur tracks. Um, Gooseneck State Park, this is south of Moab, uh, just north of Fort Corners. And I threw this slide in because I've stopped here a bunch of times when I'm driving between Yellowstone and headed down to family in Arizona. It's a great place just to get off the road and run around for a minute, stretch my legs. Uh, but I finally got to raft the San Juan River and I was so looking forward to, and I knew as soon as I came around that one gooseneck, it does this like six or seven times, these big long bends. And um, I could look up and see that viewpoint that I looked down upon from so many times. Um, so just another short uh, place to pop off the road and look way out there in the distance. Can you see that monolith um, all over this part of, as we're nearing Four Corners, um, the, the Mexican hat, which is just north of the town of Mexican hat, um, as we're nearing into Monument Valley. Now, I, I wanted to take a second with this slide. Um, take a look. Let's see if I can get my cursor here. Um, this is a recent, um, there's a, 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 a presidential decree under the Obama administration that set aside Bears Ears National Monument, and it was two different units. Um, and then under the previous administration, um, we ended up um, uh, losing that designation um, and now it's reinstated. Um, but Bears Ears is one of the most important places archeologically um, in the world. Um, one of the most dense places, that's the, the actual butte kind of over Aria's head, my daughter's head there. Um, this is at Edge of the Cedars State Park, um, which was a great, we thought we were going to pop in for an hour. We ended up there for like five hours. They had to kick us out. It's in Blanding, Utah. Um, and it did afford a chance to get into uh, the very womb, uh, cozy like center of uh, their, uh, the, the ancient Puebloan housing, which is the Kiva. We'll talk more about that. Um, but the Bears Ears, um, it, one of the reasons why it's so critically important is that it was the first time that a national monument was created at the request of indigenous tribes. And um, the uh, obviously, and many of us know these stories, right? The federal government and the tribal relationships have um, been uh, everything from um, absolutely uh, wretched and awful uh, up to just ignoring. 
Um, and so having Bears Ears Monument back on the ground and back on the map, it's a really important place. Um, and I found this website, bearsearsmonument.com, um, not just for information about this area, but it was a really well done website on just uh, a lot of cultural sensitivity. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. And it did pull some of this land out. Um, existing leases will stay, but things like um, uh, energy development, new mining uh, leases won't go in. And so I'm kind of happy to keep some of this canyon country um, as pristine as it always has been. Um, I mentioned that word ancient Puebloans earlier. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we used the word Anasazi, and now we know that that's a Navajo word, a Diné word uh, that means um, ancient enemy. Not a very nice way to talk about your neighbors. So these days we talk about the ancient Puebloans and that is the culture. Um, another thing, when I was a kid, they talked about how um, the people just disappeared. Um, they didn't disappear. They packed it up and moved down to the Rio Grande Valley uh, riverways back in about 1300 or so. Um, but being able to step out and walk among these ancient villages is a really um, powerful way to connect to this landscape. Um, Hoven Weep here just north of Four Corners has some really interesting um, architectural designs. I love that cozy little house down there, uh, but we don't really know. There's some speculation about um, because the interesting shapes of the buildings, maybe some granaries, observatories, um, defensive structures, uh, not really sure. Um, and this is shortly after the ancient Puebloans would have um, started to settle in and um, uh, start farming, um, which was around maybe 600, 700 CE, um, current era, uh, and start developing these um, amazing structures. Um, gosh, Cedar Mesa uh, over just into Colorado, right on the other side of Four Corners, um, is sort of towards the later end of, of the occupation from about 500 when the um, hunter-gatherer, sort of more nomadic culture began farming. Um, things like the Three Sisters, squash, bean, and corn, um, and building these structures, uh, beginning with some subsurface structures and then moving up to the surface and then these cliff dwellings right uh, around 1200, 1100 to 1300 CE. Um, an interesting comment about these places, you know, so this is a national park. Um, the, the Pueblo people tell us that their ancestors built these to be sort of taken back over by nature to just fall apart gently. Um, so it's a little bit of a cultural conundrum with the US government um, rebuilding and structuring these walls. Um, but I'll tell you what, when you're out on Cedar Mesa and it's a huge uh, ge geographic structure, it's like 400 square miles, and you're looking down these canyon walls Get out your binoculars, look in the, the top center of your screen there, um, and then zoom in a little bit. And you start to think about the people that lived here. Um, you start to wonder um, about what caused that mass migration. You'll see this symbol around different places on the plateau, um, down to the Rio Grande, what was happening? Um, and picturing um, lively villages in these structures, right? Children screaming and yelling and maybe playing hide and seek and um, mama's cooking and uh, um, men coming back from the hunt and bringing food down to these villages. And, and you can look in to these places and see uh, faces of these ancient spirits peering back at you. And so there really is something to being able to stay in touch with these landscapes um, and preserve and protect them and understand them um, as long as we're inviting in that that um, the, the more uh, current native uh, peoples into these conversations. And that's something that's been missing um, for a long time, being able to um, look into um, these ancient uh, places does help us to uh, connect, I think, more deeply with both the people um, as, well as, um, as well as the landscape. Um, take a look at this photograph and you can see the top of a ladder sticking up out. Now you had been able to go into this um, village. Um, I think this is Spruce Tree House, but there's some structural integrity with the rock walls above it. So the park service isn't allowing anyone in. Other places are closed down because of COVID, um, just uh, trying not to concentrate people. Um, but back to Edge of the Cedars State Park where we could climb down into that Kiva. 
Um, these kivas are uh, such an important part of the culture. This is actually one of those pit houses that started being designed when people stopped being um, quite so nomadic on the plateau and started settling into permanent uh, villages and um, mostly subterranean homes. This would have been the kitchen and uh, sort of the center of the universe for these families. Um, ultimately, they have turned into what is now mostly ceremonial use, but keep an eye out for these kivas. And it is always a reminder um, of the spiritual connection with the earth, you know, even uh, uh, those of us that that haven't can't claim ancestry on this landscape, um, remembering uh, what an important part of the the culture that the land itself actually is. Um, wandering over towards Canyon of the Ancients, um, it's in broken into some different units, um, some really neat places like. Um, Saddlehorn Pueblo, some cliff dwellings, uh, that's up Sand Creek. Um, looking at wood that was probably growing as a tree a thousand years ago or more. And in this desiccated environment, um, it sort of gets um, uh, cemented into place and then might've been a floor joist for a, a layer. Some of these structures go up multi-stories. Um, and look at the thickness of the walls. Um, this is over at Lowry Pueblo, where a lot of it has been restructured and re-cemented, um, not all of it, but um, it is it is it is pretty cool to be able to go in and feel how much cooler it is inside of these places um, on a hot summer day or warmer in the winter. Um, this is another structure. And I hesitated to, um, a lot of these places are much more remote than in the national parks. Um, and I hesitated to put this picture in because um, it is a place where you can approach the um, the structures, uh, as opposed to some of the places up at Cedar Mesa. Um, but I'm so proud of my daughter for learning the lesson well to not touch the walls. Um, don't lean in on them. You know, they're not going to last long with a, a bunch of people. Um, but there's not a ton of signage or ranger programs going on in places like this. Um, and so just again, a, a reminder to um, travel gently across these landscapes as we look from our current times into the past. Um, and uh, uh, not all of them were simple structures. Chaco Canyon, um, they say all roads lead to Chaco. Now this building, Pueblo Bonita, had maybe six to 800 rooms, um, uh, maybe up to five stories. And by the way, take a look over here on the left side of your screen. Um, can you see how there's these stanchions kind of supporting that wall? Um, the minute that we excavate and expose this stuff to the elements the minute it begins to decay back. Um, so, so again, those fine lines between um, preserving and learning um, and allowing uh, the original intention of these buildings. Uh, but this was not just a, a little family structure. This was a major center, um, possibly around commerce and trading. There's been talk of maybe like learning university monasteries maybe, but obviously, uh, a place of cultural importance across the entire plateau. And in fact, NASA has aerial uh, uh, photographs, um, satellite photographs, and you can see these huge processional roads. They say all roads lead to Chaco and all of those different um, uh, nations and, and pueblos that I showed you earlier during that lands acknowledgement have some uh, knowledge of this place, Chaco, um, these huge giant structures um, tons of cool stuff to investigate, including there in the center of your screen, um, a mano. Um, you might find a matate, the, the actual grinding stone. Um, you can find kernels of corn that might be a thousand years old. Uh, those T-shaped doors, that's a, a, a structural thing that you'll see across the plateau. A Fajada Butte there in the distance. Um, this was a a fairly advanced culture with archaeoastronomy. Um, we've learned a lot more. Bahada Butte is where um, there was these three big slabs of sandstone set up as such, where on the summer solstice it shines through and creates a, a, a light dagger. They call it the sun dagger that intersects a spiral on the wall um, on, on uh, solstice. And um, some rock art that, that there's a little controversy, but might indicate. Um, uh, an event that was documented around the world, the um, supernova in 1054, which was now we know it as the Crab Nebula, but they said you could see it 
in daylight. So it was, it would have been an event that these people noticed, right. That were living there at the time um, that lower image, I've seen it more stylized where you see more color in it, uh, drawing out the color of the old paint that's faded now, but um, potentially it was right around the time that Haley's comment was passing over. So um, clearly um, a powerful spot and a place that um, a place that's uh, worth investigating. It's very far off the beaten path. It's not easy to get to. Um, there is not a lot of infrastructure there. Um, but moving down right to Four Corners proper, um, it is a fun spot. You can literally stand in all four states at the same time. Um, and uh, it's uh, a, a Navajo tribal park. I, I said I left my daughter in another state. This was just this past fall on a road trip. And um, she was pretty excited to go. It is a fun place to pop out. And uh, often in the summer, you'll have artisans that surround the place and you can check out some really fun art. Um, and then cutting across the uh, Navajo Nation, um, there are places where you can get off the road and formally go uh, up closer to these structures in Monument Valley. Some of this might look familiar, um, lots of movie scenes over the years. In fact, um, that is where Forrest Gump ended his run, if you remember. Um, and I put in this picture because I wanted to show you this stand over here. Um, all across the, the nation, um, I love stopping at these stands. It's a great place to um, meet some local folks. These are families that come out um, from their properties way out, uh, their, their homesteads way out in the in the um, desert and come up to the side of the highway and you can find great pottery and um, beautiful jewelry and other types of artwork. Um, look for um, cultural events when you're traveling across the plateau, um, public events, powwows, things like that, art shows. Um, that's a, a really neat way to um, be able to connect in with, um, with some of the, the, the native culture. Um, there's a number of other parks here, uh, the tribal parks when you can. Um, I highly recommend, in fact, I mentioned Canyon de Chez, um, say Diné Heritage Area. Um, there's, a, there's a federally managed national monument um, section on the canyon rim um, down at the bottom of, of uh, Canyon de Chez, you can only go with, a, with a, um, a Navajo guide. So any chance that you get to do that, I highly recommend it. Um, I think you'll get a lot more out of that connection. Um, and I know Mara's trip coming up, um, that uh, those a few folks on tonight have joined up. Um, and I think you still have a couple spots open, right, Mara? Um, and uh, I, I noticed that there was a, a, a local native guide that was going to take folks out for one of those days. And so um, that's really a, a great way to go. Um, not a great picture of a pretty infamous site, the Mittens. And so I was traveling with my daughter and we had this little um, uh, kids book about some of the more famous sites. So better, better image of it for you as you're um, traveling across the Navajo Nation. Um, and then all of a sudden you start to see the land fall away and you're wondering what is over there? Well, if you could levitate, you would see the Colorado River, um, not in its natural state. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that down the road. Um, Colorado actually means red and if it's running um, like it normally would without dams on either end, um, it would not be this clear, cold, green stream. It would be a, a turbulent red um, and not, so that's how the Colorado got its name. Um, but uh, you'd hardly know that you're approaching it until you're basically on top of it. Um, this is coming up from the South, up from Williams where I'm from. And the last few miles you're in this ponderosa pine forest. I, I took this photograph from a fire tower that's off the South Rim, um, but you could barely, you feel like you could just stumble into it if you didn't know what was coming. Um, the Grand Canyon, is almost unknowable. Um, I've spent my entire life uh, hiking in it, camping in it, traveling around its edges. Um, I did a rim to rim hike, um, started way over here um, up at the North Rim Lodge and then hiked down through the Bright Angel Canyon, cross the river and then up to the South Rim um, in a single day. That was a, a big accomplishment. My dad met me down there and it was a, a, a real highlight of my life, um, just something I wanted to do. Um, you can still get into the canyon on, on mules. Everybody wants to know that, um, although they've limited, limited the mule trains um, and the mule skinners to certain trails and certain times of the day and such. 
Um, but the Grand Canyon is a, a it is grand. Um, it's about 277 river miles. Um, and it's and easy enough to stay at the South Rim with some advanced planning. Um, these places are getting tougher to get into, um, just everybody wanting to visit these places, but that's El Tovar Lodge, a, a little incongruous. It's um, uh, the early days, the railroads, uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad were really pushing um, visitation to the parks. And so they were appealing to wealthy Europeans and well-heeled Easterners. And so it's kind of this, um, like a Swiss chalet uh, feel. Um, Thunderbird Lodge to the right of that, um, maybe a little more uh, uh, blends into the scenery a little bit uh, better. Um, you know, and normally I would recommend staying outside, getting out for a hike or a walk, uh, but there are some cool buildings. Mary Coulter was uh, an architect for the uh, park in the early years, and she actually went up to um, Orabai, which is the uh, uh, Hopi village up on the mesas, um, probably the longest continuous settlement in um, the U.S. Um, when, when that mass migration happened um, from around the Four Corners area down to the Rio Grande, um, the Hopi stayed right where they've always been. Um, and so Mary Coulter went and asked them uh, to come and help uh, design the Hopi house. It's a, it's a store. Um, run by the local concession, but um, it's well worth your time to go in and it's uh, a truly authentic um, building with that masonry. Again, uh, another building that, I, that I, I wouldn't steer you away from is the Cold Studio. The Cold Brothers were photographers in the early days and river runners. And um, there's a plain art uh, exhibit every year that has just some really um, touching and poignant ways of being able to try and capture this canyon, um, it's, it's, uh, it can be difficult to do. Um, and uh, imagine, you know, this was basically a blank spot on the map, um, you know, up until uh, some of the first white folks started visiting. Uh, 1869, um, uh, John Wesley Powell was the first person to run the canyon. And um, he, um, he started up at the headwaters in the Green River, which is up in the, the Wind Rivers. So just south of me, actually, it starts in the um, at the south end of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And the Green River accounts for about 70% in its tributaries, about 70% of the Colorado River. Um, so John Wesley Powell started up there with 10 men and four boats. Um, right away, within the first couple of weeks, a, a boat got smashed against the rocks. And um, they had all of their barometers, some scientific equipment. That was the way that they could gauge their elevation on this one boat. Um, and nobody wanted to try to cross the rapids to go to go recover it until the guys remembered that they had snuck on some whiskey. And so they did volunteer to go get the instrumentation and uh, continue on downstream. But um, one of the fellas just walked off the expedition about halfway through. And when they entered the Grand Canyon, um, it was terrifying. By the way, um, Powell had one arm. He was a, a captain in, in the Civil War and got one of his arms blown off. I can't imagine trying to raft the river um, and uh, navigating down. Um, towards the end of August, they'd started in May, and towards the end of August, it was getting pretty spooky, and they were starving. Their rations had either gotten moldy or lost in these rapids, and um, towards the end, um, three of the men decided to ditch the expedition and they left, never to be seen from again. There's a couple theories on what happened. They hit the rim and disappeared. Um, so Powell and his five remaining men just two days later did exit the canyon. Um, they made it out and he went back and did it again a couple of years later. Um, so some exciting stories of the early exploration of the Grand Canyon. Um, but we cannot talk about the Colorado River or the Grand Canyon without talking about water. Um, Potawatosi, water is life. And we are in some interesting times. And, and I, I think it's worth spending just a minute or two um, to talk about what's going on on both sides of the Colorado, um, because this isn't just a local issue to say the national park or just a, a tribe or two. Um, 40 million people rely on drinking water from the Colorado River. Um, this is on the lower end, Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. That picture in the top right, um, that's what it looked like when I was a kid. You could drive across the dam back then. Now they've built this gigantic building. 
Um, and you can see the towers up there, um, up here, power generation. Um, these are intake valves and look how much lower the water is these days. Um, and so the water, the power generation is threatened as well as of course the drinking water. Um, up on the other end of the canyon, on the upstream end, is Lake Powell, um, the, the uh, Glen Canyon Dam blocked off uh, the river and created Lake Powell. And um, this is a huge part of the local economy. Um, it, it's completely submerged Glen Canyon. And again, um, drinking water, economy. Um, but the problem is, is that this sandstone is really porous. Um, and once you dam it up, there's a ton of evapotranspiration. So back in 1922, when the Colorado River Pact got together with the seven states in Mexico, no tribes, of course, were invited to the table um, to allocate the water. It didn't account for how rapidly um, we were going to lose Lake Powell. And now this might have been a sinuous arm of Lake Powell, but it's turning back into the river really quickly, like right before our eyes. Um, I encourage you, if you want to learn more, go to Glen Canyon Institute uh, website there. Um, the good news is, is that we are resilient. Um, us human beings are smart and um, we are adaptable and we are all going to have to learn to live with less. Um, I think that that is writ on the table. And so um, in what ways, as we are navigating these landscapes, can we be mindful of that? In what ways can we um, travel through them with respect? And, and even um, how that affects us in our own homes. I saw lots of folks back East and on the West Coast and New Zealand, all around the world. Um, what can we do to care more deeply um, for these precious landscapes, even if it's not in your own backyard. Um, Padawokatsi, water is life. Um, always, always um, important to remember. Um, with our last few minutes here, um, let's take a, a, a walk. Let's go for a walk into the Grand Canyon. Um, I never had a chance to see the Grand Canyon for the first time. Um, and I don't think my daughter will ever remember that as well. I'm so grateful to um, my family for um, my stepmom in particular for dragging me into the canyon all those times when I was a kid and thought she was trying to kill me. Um, that's us heading down the South Kaibab Trail. But um, when you can really get into um, the canyon, it gives you a chance to really get to know this landscape a little bit better. Um, and I love, um, I love uh, this quote, um, from uh, Aldous Huxley, he says, we can only love what we know and we can never know completely what we do not love. Love is a mode of knowledge. And so being knowledgeable about this landscape over the course of my lifetime has increased my appreciation and love for it. Um, so let's head in and take a look at some of the features. Um, do you see that big broad plane kind of right in the middle of your screen? It's about two thirds of the way down the canyon. Um, and again, in this stretch, um, the canyon's about 10 miles wide. Uh, that's the Tonto platform here. I'll kind of highlight it here. The Tonto plat Plateau, and it stretches all of those 277 miles. Um, it basically sits right above what we call the inner gorge. If you look down into this deeper part of the canyon, um, and it's a great place to hike. Um, this is looking from basically El Tovar, that hotel is behind me. Um, getting ready to head down the Bright Angel Trail. And if you notice, there's that trail that goes out at dead ends at that point called Plateau Point, and you're looking down into the depths if you don't have the time or the ability to get all the way down to the river. Not advised. People do it all the time. They go, oh, the river's right there. Um, and some of the early explorers thought that too. They're like, oh, we're just going to run down to the river. And like days later, and people are falling off the cliff and dying from dehydration. Um, this is a much larger landscape than we can really even get our heads around. And people get in trouble every year. Um, so know what you're getting into. Um, but it is a, a possible for a day hike. It's about 10 miles out to that point and back up. Um, but notice that real lush green spot there, that oasis. Um, that has been called Indian Gardens. This is in the spring. Um, so for those of you uh, traveling with Mara, you might notice some uh, really verdant areas down there. The cottonwood is sort of blowing around right now. Um, Indian Gardens was so named because people were living there 
the Havasupa I were living there and gardening. Um, this was uh, after the park was created in 1919, all the way up until 1928 before they were formally escorted down to the Havasupai Reservation. Um, it is a great destination to turn around, uh, day hike down and back up just to the gardens themselves. There's water along the way on that South Kaibab Trail. But I'm really happy to announce that the Park Service is changing the name. It's in the works right now um, to have a soup by garden, which is the least we can do to honor um, the people that are still here, still living in the canyon. Um, Getting down here in the canyon affords us a chance to really get to know it a little bit better, start to get our heads around it. Um, can you see that light band out there towards the canyon rim? Um, that's Coconino Sandstone. And it is really evident everywhere that you go all around the Grand Canyon. You can see that banding even in a sunset day. Um, that is, remember that picture from Zion where I uh, mentioned that cross hatching and how sandstone will get sand will get blown around and then cemented in. Um, this is actually down on the river with a geologist who cut out um, a, a section of a sand dune and you could see it right before your eyes. This is actual sand, um, not turned to stone, but you can see how if it sat there for a few million years, it would turn into what you see above it into the sandstone. Um, and so this Coconino sandstone is a desert that sat across this area for five to 10 million years. Um, and you can see some cool fossils in there, some trace fossils. Um, here's kind of a side cut view. So we're here in this Coconino sandstone uh, 270 million years ago. I know these numbers are big. Um, let's go down to the Redwall limestone when in this area, there was a shallow inland sea um, the red wall, you can see that 500 foot cliff there kind of right in that banding right in the middle of your screen, um, a formidable um, barrier to travel in the canyon. Um, and the red wall is actually a layer of marine life. Um, so I have a shell just to give us a, a good example. Um, imagine these ancient inland seas, and this was when this patch of land was a little closer to the equator. So these shallow marine environments and something like a seashell, the whatever creature dies and it floats down to the sea floor and it compacts and compacts. That's how we get limestone. And actually limestone would be whitish. This is a white layer. Here, what you're seeing is where the red above it has sort of stained the canyon walls. Um, so it is just, uh, I think, really exciting to be in these environments and um, even just a few little tidbits to be able to appreciate where we are. Um, I went on the most geeked out trip um, in the Grand Canyon uh, with uh, paleobotanists and geologists and uh, um, uh, uh, paleontologists, um, Kirk Johnson, who has uh, is a, an extraordinary career. Um, and so he's out here drawing in the sand, a crinoid, um, and because uh, he's gonna show us um, and this is so much fun, um, an actual fossil of a crinoid. These are these marine creatures that you can see. Um, it's one of those bottom feeders that would be like, can you kind of see those tentacles on the left-hand side, um, be able to, to reach out and feed the, the, the phytoplankton in the oceans. Here's a cross section of one. So the body itself would have been cemented into the stone in a, a vertical fashion. Um, Whew, being able to look into and think about and touch these um, ancient giant landscapes is really um, a, a, a very place putting experience. It's one of the things about the Grand Canyon. Um, it's a very place uh, putting, um, uh, it puts us in our place in time and space. Um, so we're seeing uh, Lacey Bryozoans, I had to look that word up. I couldn't remember what all these things are called, brachiopods down here um, on the river. And um, I don't have pictures of trace fossils, but this is what could turn into a trace fossil. Some little insect or little bug got out there and started wandering around, maybe a, a lizard chasing after the bug. And if that gets cemented and then exposed many millions of years down the road, this is exactly how we end up with fossils. Um, now there's no dinosaur, actually, I was gonna say there's no dinosaur fossils in the canyon because you would have to be at some of those higher layers, but actually they did just find um, just real recently some, some fossils that are 
uh, making us question some of those time frames. Um, but anytime that you are in the canyon, um, while we're talking about these big rock structures, um, don't forget to look around at the gardens. Um, this is agave, uh, and uh, these guys are also called century plants. They, they just bloom once and then scatter their seeds. Um, so it might be 60 or 70 years um, before that giant bloom shoots up in one season. Uh, but this is a really important plant, uh, both for indigenous culture um, and even now, uh, if you look um, right at those really spiky tips, um, they could be good for sewing, good for needles. Um, there's also antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties. You can heal cuts and wounds. There's medicinal uses. Um, good for, um, I, like, I like the way this said it, malicious gut bacteria, <laughs> agave. Um, and of course, for food, some of us have agave syrup in our um, in our uh, in our cupboards, um, yucca, another really important plant, um, very fibrous, um, and those flowers. So there's a, a symbiotic relationship with a special moth called a yucca moth that um, will collect pollen from one flower, fly over to another, lay her eggs in the stigma of one of those of of one of those flowers, and then stuff it full of pollen. Um, and then the seeds begin to grow. Her larva eats some of the seeds, but many of the seeds will um, come to fruition and be able to plant new, um, new plants, um, kind of a neat relationship. And you can see that fiber good for um, basket making, ropes, uh, mats, thatching, um, all kinds of uses, soaps and medicines as well. Um, tons of wildflowers and other gardens on the plateau. Um, so make sure you pay attention to the details when you're in these landscapes. Um, here's a special flower um, that we literally watched. It's the night, uh, the uh, sacred datura. And it was like a sped up, um, a sped up film and you could watch it burst open in the dark. And, and uh, that's the kind of bloom that's gonna attract moths, maybe bats. Um, some really special plants down here in these desert lands, um, as well as, as other types of creatures, some, some uh, the red spotted toad. And I love these canyon tree frogs. They're tiny. They're only like two inches tall or long, uh, but they, um, they, they can uh, climb trees. They've got these really great suction pads for climbing trees. Um, things you don't necessarily want to see. Um, I happen to have my camera on Zoom for something out in the distance and this thing ran across the trail in front of me. Um, I would love to think it was the Grand Canyon Rattler, which is an endemic uh, only found in the Grand Canyon, but it, it's probably a Great Basin. Uh, probably not a Diamondback, just judging on the, on this, on the pattern, but uh, be careful, uh, watch your step. There are rattlesnakes all across the Colorado Plateau. Um, but don't forget to look up to um, these turkey vultures, that pair of turkey vultures. Those are probably about a six foot wingspan, maybe about the size of um, a bald eagle. Um, and then check out that giant condor. Um, the California condors have a wingspan of nine feet. They're huge. They look like ultralight airplanes flying around in the sky. Um, and another great story of recovery um, we got down to about 22 individuals and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and other uh, service and other agencies um, were up to about 500. This was a chick. Um, I, the mama in me was feeling bad. He's, he wanted so badly to make it over to mom or maybe dad. I'm not sure who's on the other side, but it didn't want to fly quite yet. So he was trying to get around this bridge stanchion. And this is a good place to see him at Navajo Bridge up on the east end of the canyon. Um, and they are uh, a story of success with what we can do when we put our minds to it. There's about 500 condors now. So um, anywhere in the canyon is a good place to keep an eye out for them. Um, hundreds of other bird species, always brother raven, everywhere you go, brother raven will be there to cackle and caw and harass you. Um, but the, the diversity in the topography from that hot, hot desert down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon up to the pine forests, um, hundreds of species of birds. Um, so with our last couple of minutes, let's take a, a dive down into that inner gorge, um, into this ancient igneous rock. Mostly what we've been looking at is sedimentary rock, um, but we're gonna take a, a last uh, wander 
through some of the deepest parts of the canyon. I have been wanting to do a river trip since I was a kid. This is me at maybe about three or four. I don't remember this moment, um, but my dad used to run shuttles. My folks were running shuttles uh, for some river rats. And, um, and I've had this picture with me my whole life and I finally had the opportunity to do it. Um, my husband, Mike and I, uh, that was a picture of him a minute ago, I um, got to spend close to two weeks on a totally geeked out trip with um, geologists and the paleobotanists and, and paleontologists, and artists, and, um, and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Um, this is uh, Upset Rapids, and I'm going to move forward just a few seconds here. Um, if you get seasick, close your eyes. <laughs> but this is going into one of the more moderate rapids, actually. I was terrified on a lot. I'm not a, I'm not a good river rat. Um, I love the desert uh, and I love being outside. We got to the bottom and I could turn right back around and start it again. Um, but these rapids, I was always, so my husband is filming, that's my head mirror. I was death gripping the boat the whole way. <laughs> um, a slightly more mellow uh, run. Now, I'm sorry if I'm, uh, busting your eardrums out there. Um, this is a lot more of what uh, some of it looked like, just floating down. You'd hit some, some, some little bit of white water, um, and then every once in a while, these huge rapids that would just terrify me. Um, but what an experience being down there, getting on river time, getting on rock time pulling over and taking hikes, um, you know, plenty of flat water to just look around um, and certainly lots of time to pull over. Um, this is at the base where Havasu Creek, you can actually hike up. Uh, let's see, hopefully I'm still here, Mara. I just got a weird notice. You're good, you're good. It was just awesome. the connection between the video. Okay, thanks. Um, Havasu, this beautiful blue-green water coming out of Havasu Creek um, is actually, anybody who's been to Yellowstone, some similar processes happening here as in the Mammoth Terraces, um, this gorgeous uh, dissolved limestone in the water and then terracing, it kind of looks like the Mammoth Terraces, it's just up the road from where I live. Um, so it's about a nine mile hike from the river up to Havasupai. Uh, up to Mooney Falls, almost 200 feet. Now we are on the Havasupai uh, Nation, the Havasupai Reservation here. This is Havasu Falls itself. You can also hike down from the rim and it's about an equal distance, maybe a little shorter, about eight miles down. Um, it's been closed because of COVID. They're being very, very careful, which is very smart. Um, but uh, I've been down here a few times and um, it is an incredibly magical landscape. You do need to get permits. You do need to be uh, plan ahead and prepare. Um, this is right in the village of Supai, um, where these people have been living and surviving and thriving for thousands of years. Um, that's uh, backpacking my dad, backpacking back up on the way back out to the rim. Um, so that river trip that we took, um, one of the reasons why we did it with this particular group was the chance to get off the off the river and do a lot of hiking. Um, the Nankoink granaries, these are a thousand years old storage units up on the side of these canyon walls. Um, I was so privileged to go. Um, we had a Hopi guide at the time anyway, he was the only indigenous um, river guide. And um, I was so blessed to be able to spend this time down here um, with this fella and learn from him and hear his stories and know that he was of this land. Um, of course, evidence of humans, um, at least 12,000 years in the canyon, but we keep finding older stuff, those footprints that were found that were um, 22,000 years old over in New Mexico recently. Um, you know, the people have been telling us that they've been here all along and uh, we are different ways of knowing, um, learning that to be true. Redwall Cavern, a uh, great place for a, a pickup game of Frisbee. And these springs that are just literally springing out of the side of the canyon walls, um, these magical gardens in the middle of the desert. 
And um, this reminds me to mention those of you that want to engage a little more deeply with this landscape to learn some of uh, the controversies with things like uranium mining on the on the rim country and how that can affect these springs, um, particularly where people are still living, like in Havasu, uh, Havasupai down in uh, Supai village. Um, Tainting our water is not a good idea and we need to be a lot smarter about it. Um, so this is a great reminder, just these gushers coming out of the side of these canyon walls, thousands of feet below the rim. Um, Grand Canyon Trust is a great um, resource for that. Um, and then in our closing moments, getting nose to nose with this ancient, ancient rock, the stuff in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, uh, this is up in a very magical hollow called Elves Chasm. Elves Chasm Nice is 1.8 billion years old. Um, this is some really ancient rock down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And then we'll pull over and find a sweet, quiet place to lay our heads for the night, listening to the roar of the river, listening for those canyon wrens that we've been hearing all across the plateau, um, getting up the next morning, seeing what's around the bend, um, trying to get our heads around this landscape. Um, there's a, a great uh, quote from Aldous Huxley um, where he says that um, the most beautiful and most profound emotion that we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the source of all true science. Um, that was Albert Einstein. Um, so I think with that, I know I went a little bit over and I, um, and I, I could have kept you for hours. There's so much to talk about, um, but thank you all so much. I'm so honored um, to have you here with me and to let me share some of these um, places of power, these um, incredibly important uh, sacred lands. And um, if we have any time, Mary, I'd love to take any questions, but again, feel free to email me um, at info at yellowstone.education. Um, sign up for Mara's uh, trips, um, if you can. Um, uh, she's headed down this way in May and we'll have an opportunity to uh, explore some of these places um, live and in person. Um, so a wonderful time to um, be able to uh, explore some of these um, powerful places. Thank you so much, Ashia. I mean, I am I am so very excited now, even more so. Um, I have one personal story to add. You when you said um, you know about the canyon adventure in the Grand Canyon and and going in and how treacherous a hike it is, and it's a 10, 10 hour hike, and just be prepared. I remember being a young person I was probably still in my 20s and I went with my husband and you know I was like oh no problem let's let's go down into the canyon and I was ill prepared didn't have enough water didn't have enough food didn't have anything oh, yeah. and oh my god every day was, was I hurting myself all the way back up it was so horribly funny but at the end of the day memory, there's people I will take it falling out yep, I will take it with me forever and I will be a lot smarter this time around when I uh, see the Grand Canyon again in May. Um, yeah, so so absolutely, if, if anybody's interested, I have a list of all of my tours on the right of this slide. So if you're interested in any of the tours coming up, please um, don't hesitate to contact me. We will go over to a q and I will say, um, just to give you a minute, you could start reading the questions, but I will say to anybody out there, if you are interested in following along with my tours, or what I'm doing in my travels, join my personal um, Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group. It's Girl Travel Tours. So it's facebook.com slash groups slash Girl Travel Tours. I'm actually off tomorrow to Paris for a long weekend to train some future group leaders to do what I started doing with the Girl Scouts. So if you want to follow along, um, it's a great place to, to do that. So join me, join me there if you'd like. Um, in the meanwhile, if you had a minute to take a breath and to to um, have a drink of water, maybe we will get into the questions. And there are some really good questions here. So I'm going to let you go to the top of the Mashia and you could just sort of read them off and then um, provide your your answers and your comments. Yeah. And I saw a couple of questions about how to connect. Yep. Uh, info at Yellowstone.education. That's a great way to email me. 
Um, and uh, check your spam. Sometimes it gets returned because it's a weird domain name, but in, uh, info at yellowstone.education all spelled out. Um, and uh, I'd love to follow up with anyone. I saw somebody ask about what kind of camera I use. Honestly, um, point and shoots, um, and, and I didn't really do much with these pictures, uh, you know, crank up the, the saturation or anything. The landscape just speaks for itself. Um, a lot of these were just taken with my phone, especially the last couple of years. And I don't have a, a very uh, high end phone. You know, it's just a, a, an older model Samsung. Um, so uh, I think it's really just the landscape um, that uh, that gives us uh, such an opportunity. It is breathtaking. I'm kind of scanning through these. Um, awesome. Some folks that are headed that way. Can you go over uh, to the Q&A, Ashia? Go uh, to the Q&A tab. Yes, I'm sorry, chat. I was over in the chat. Exactly. Yeah, let's see, this will make it a little bit easier. Um, how much are permits? It depends on where you're going and what you're doing. Sometimes it's only a few dollars. It's just more to make sure that we're not inundating these areas. Um, the slot canyons, Marie, there was uh, dozens. Uh, I probably showed at least, you know, eight different slot canyons. So uh, San Rafael Swell, um, uh, some in Zion. They can be very dangerous, particularly with um, uh, flash flooding. That's the most dangerous thing, but also remote. You know, it's not a good place to break an arm or, you know, start uh, running out of water or food. Um, indigenous tribes benefiting financially from the tourist money. Um, more so now than in the past, particularly with the Navajo tribal parks, um, rather than just leaving it all to the federal government um, or state governments um, taking over some of those areas, uh, Antelope Canyon, you know, any of your permit fees do help uh, the tribes, absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, Indian Princess laying down, Saleya, I'm not sure. I know there's a sleeping Ute or the sleeping giant just outside of uh, Dolores. I'm not sure if that's the same area. Um, uh, seeing, uh, um, oh, you can see Mesa Verde from your home. That's awesome. Uh, Chaco is not a huge canyon. Um, it's not a huge park, um, but there are miles of hiking trails around it. So it's nothing like the size of Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon or anything like that. Um, how did they make the rectangular stones they used in all those buildings? That's a great question. Um, it's mostly just the way that sandstone fractures. It kind of fractures into um, those slabs, those neat slabs. And so it's easy to, to use for masonry. Um, how far in advance to plan um, for camping or park access? Uh, at least a year these days. I mean, you can find some last minute stuff, but particularly um, Arches is just going to timed entry, um, particular places like Angel's Landing in Zion, um, certainly lodging um, it, it, as, as much in advance as you can. Um, and I'm sorry to hear of some connectivity issues. Best time of year to visit, um, yeah, spring and fall, I guess, um, you know, winter, especially at those higher elevations, um, summer's really hot, um, but yeah. Uh, um, uh, spring and fall, both both uh, kind of the shoulder seasons tend to um, uh, be uh, more comfortable. Um, anybody can explore some of these areas. Um, most of, especially the more established national parks like Arches and Canyonlands, uh, Zion. There's accessibility, uh, Grand Canyon. Um, so don't don't let uh, accessibility issues um, stop you. Um, May or September better for the parks again, you know, it really, um, I, there's, there's benefits to both, you know, the spring flowers are amazing in the spring, um, in the fall, um, it's, uh, you know, there's, it's cooler, um, the aspens are turning, um, so, uh, maybe the elk rut is happening, there's advantages to both, um, thanks for these kind words, I appreciate that, and, um, hopefully I'm not, missing much. What are the weather conditions in the canyon? Um, I love that question because I like the answer, all of the weather. <laughs> you can have snow at the rim and blazing hot at the bottom of the canyon. It's one of the reasons why people get into trouble because you start at either seven or 8,000 feet, depending on the south rim or the north rim, and you don't realize that you're going down so deep into this really intense desert. Um, so uh, it, it's one of the reasons to plan ahead and prepare. Um, uh, the best way to see the Colorado Plateau, 
Um, that's such a tough question, you know, on foot uh, is a good answer, um, but there's so many beautiful places that you can drive to. Um, and uh, seniors who can't walk forever on these trains, I know, and I can't walk forever <laughs> these days either. Um, how many bottles would I carry? Um, I would take, I would never leave my vehicle without probably three liters of water if I'm gonna go any more than a few miles. Um, I always carry more than I need. Um, and so, um, yeah, and for, for those of you that, you know, aren't gonna be tromping down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, um, there are places where you can still get away from the crowds, um, especially along rim trails that are accessible, um, you know, both paved and non-paved. Um, question about the rapids, the Grand Canyon has its own scale. <laughs> they don't even do the one to five. So it's off the charts. There's like eights and nines. It was insane. It was a, a wild, wild trip. Um, yes, I have been to the wave and actually some of those pictures were in there. Um, but I do, um, I'm, I'm very cautious about um, advertising every little place. Um, some books, I actually meant to mention these. Um, if you're interested in the geology, this is Carving Grand Canyon by Wayne Ranney. He's um, one of the premier geologists in the area. Um, there's also a wonderful introduction, um, L. Greer Price, um, an introduction to Grand Canyon geology. Um, this is good for the whole plateau. It'll mention all of these other places. Um, both of those are really good references. Um, if you're traveling with kids, um, Grand Canyon um, by Jason Chin is a really great book. Um, it's uh, it'll show you like you know what it looked like um, many millions of years ago, and this little girl traveling with her dad and taking dives under the ocean. Um, I always like a place-based book. Um, the Monkey Wrench Gang, some of you know um, Ed Abbey, old Edward Abbey. Um, Desert Solitaire is a nonfiction book. Um, learning more about water issues, I would say um, uh, Desert Cadillac is getting a little dated, but that's a really fantastic overall story. Um, tons of websites. Go to the tribal websites, um, not just the chamber websites like with Moab or, or uh, Durango or some of the, the towns around. Um, uh, investigate into some of those tribal websites. And I have a list somewhere um, uh, that I can't find right now. Um, but, but do investigate um, uh, Grand Canyon Institute, um, the uh, Glen Canyon Institute, Grand Canyon Trust, um, tons and tons of resources out there. I could probably go on about that for a few, um, a few years. Um, hopefully I've answered some of these already. Um, anything specific to know about before you go? Just a, a lot of topography changes. So um, you could have uh, rain and snow in, in spring and summer, uh, spring and fall months. Um, you could have temperatures well over 100 degrees in the summer. Um, the circular sketching on the rocks signify, you know, that spiral pattern, if I'm, if I'm getting your question right, um, it, as best as, as I understand it is a a symbol for migration, and all of us are always in 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 movement, whether that's internal or external. But uh, a lot of times, when people would pick up and move locations, and particularly that mass migration that happened off of the Colorado Plateau, uh, the Four Corners area in around 1300, um, we see that dating when they headed down for the Rio Grande, where they still are now. Um, uh, Moderate breathing issues where you have trouble, um, not if you're taking it easy, um, you know, drink lots of water when you're coming up to altitude, you know, Williams, uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon, 7,000 feet, uh, some of the lower lying areas down around Navajo Nation, Four Corners, it's a little bit lower, but it is up at altitude, so um, just take it easy on yourself. Um, you can still hike down to Phantom and out in a day, you don't have to have a permit for that, you can day hike it if you are well prepared and fit. I've done it many, many times. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, a great way to get to know the canyon, but uh, don't go into it lightly. Um, other ways of getting to the bottom of the Grand Canyon on a raft. Uh, um, and once you're in it, you're in it, um, but they do half canyon trips. So you can start at the upper end and go to Phantom Ranch and hike out or start at Phantom and go down to the lower part um, down towards uh, Lake Mead. Um, and there are still some mule trails. Um, Zantara runs uh, some mule trips down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Um, oh, good question um, about bathroom facilities. 
Um, you know, in the desert these days, we're actually asking people to pack it out. And that is the way it goes. You know, um, when you pee on the river, when on our river trip, you can just pee right in the water. That's, that's not recommended up here in my ecosystem up here in Yellowstone. Um, number two, we're packing it out these days. There's some different systems like wag bags. You can set it up over a bucket and then we tie it up and take it out. There's just a lot of us visiting these places um, and uh, trying to keep it um, very clean is really important. Um, uh, I did not study paleontology. Um, I, uh, I am actually, uh, I, I'm sort of a generalist, a naturalist guide. My, my background is actually in, in writing and theater of all things. Um, where was it they closed the road? That is in Zion. Um, Zion is mostly shuttles only um, for most of the year. Um, you have to be on a shuttle system. So that's where you can ride the bikes out. Um, can a list of books be posted? Um, I wouldn't mind putting that on Mara's Facebook page. Um, we can make a post about that. So I'll, I'll gather those resources together. I'm seeing a few folks asking about that. You can send that list to me and I will include it with tomorrow's follow-up okay. email as well Fantastic. as put it on the site with the recording. Very good. Um, best route in a road trip to visit um, Grand Canyon. Oh, I just lost it. Um, through Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, or California. Um, you, you know, it depends on your other inclinations. Um, are you doing, uh, you know, do you want to get out and hike? What time of year it is? Is it um, North Rim is a totally different experience. Only about 10% of the, gosh, I think 5 million visitors that visit Grand, or is it more than that? What's the visitation of Grand Canyon? I can't think off the top of my head. It's a lot. Um, only 10% of them go to the North Rim. Um, so it really just depends and, and they're different, you know, from the South Rim. Um, uh, let's see, comment on Mesa Verde um, and Cedar Mesa are related. Um, Mesa Verde is um, actually, I think the larger of the, of the geographic structures. Mesa Verde is like 400 square miles. I think Cedar Mesa is a little bit smaller. Um, so similar cultural um, associations, you know, similar people that have been up there since the beginning. And um, I think uh, I think Cedar Mesa is moving over more towards the Ute and Paiute people. Um, uh, still, still some ancient Pueblo um, culture up there as well. And I'm not sure that I'm answering that as well as I could. Um, uh, certainly culturally related. Um, you know, all of these cultures uh, were were um, across that that landscape um, and are still. Ashia, did you answer the question, are dogs allowed in the national parks? Oh, um, no, I must have missed that one. And if I, you could scan through them too, I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, dogs are allowed in national parks, but really limited. They're not allowed on any trails. They're basically not allowed out of the, out of the parking lots. And so, um, Honestly, you know, a lot of these public lands aren't great places. People come to Yellowstone with their dogs. You can't hike with them. Um, they can be a nuisance and harass our wildlife or they can get eaten by our wildlife. We've had that happen. Um, we had a dog jump into a hot spring this past year. Um, same thing out in these desert environments. It's really hard to travel with enough water um, for a dog that's used to having, you know, access to water. Uh, plenty of people do hike with their pets. Um, but uh, in the national parks in particular, it's really limited. Um, there is a kennel at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, as well as some of the smaller towns around the plateau. If you're planning on going on your own, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the variation of lodging and how available they are, given the fact that the national parks are so popular during the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, uh, definitely um, plan ahead and prepare. You know, it's we're looking at a year out for some of those, uh, especially places like El Tovar, uh, some of the more well-known Zion Lodge, things like that. Um, even in Moab, like a super eight room is going to cost you three hundred dollars at the height of the season. So, um, so, so, so there's a lot of variety in the lodging. Um, there's glamping. You know, there's tons of of RV and campgrounds as well. Um, but if you want to get into uh, into one of the lodges, um, there's also lots of cancellations, so it's always worth keeping keeping up with, um, you know, checking in. Um, but but a whole wide variety. Um, there's there's everything from 
uh, hostels to, you know, suites that cost a thousand dollars a night or more um, in the in, in and around the parks. Lots of, um, you know, we're struggling with this in a lot of our border towns, but there are a lot of um, VRBOs, vacation rentals, uh, Airbnb type situations as well. So if you're interested in getting into some of these places, there's some options. Um, the best way to get to Arches, um, Salt Lake City is probably your closest large airport. Um, from Salt Lake down to Arches is a few hours, a, you know, a, a half a day drive with getting out of the airport and getting out of the Salt Lake area. Um, okay, so to finish this off, I'm going to ask you something personal because I'm I'm now thinking about it for my trip. Which one is the wow of the wows? They're all wows, right? But which one stands out to you to um, to really give it the time that's needed? And let's take the Grand Canyon out of the mix, right? Because I think that's an obvious. Yeah, um, that was going to be my first answer. Right, right. So I'm going to make it difficult for you. You know, which is a surprise to you, or or just something that you just couldn't drive by if you if you were in that region of the Canyon Country. Boy, it's a tough one because it's so diverse. You know, even some of the places like Bryce, you know, that I don't get to very often that I just find new places every time I go. Um, I think some, for me personally, and I know that this isn't accessible for everyone, but I think for me personally, um, some of the places that aren't being blogged about, you know, that aren't uh, being, uh, you know, there's not websites with a lot of directions on how to get there. Um, some places like, uh, you know, on the San Rafael Swell or down in the Vermilion Cliffs area, um, um, around the outside edge of the canyon, uh, even some of the mountains in northern Arizona that I that I grew up climbing. Um, you know, I think the I think the most special places, and so it's not an easy answer, but I think the most special places are the ones that um, I have been shown personally or. Um, that I'm led to. And, and again, it's such a powerful place, the, the Colorado Plateau. And mm -hmm. maybe some of that has to do with that human habitation for so long. But um, I, think, I think being open-minded um, and, and uh, being open to like, I wonder what's, wonder what's down that road or right. you know, down what's over there. Um, and I do have to say, I love slot canyons. They kind of terrify me, but um, I do love getting into slot canyons. It's very- um, Reminds me of Petra actually in Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's uh, yeah. it's uh, going back into that inner, inner self. I have a follow-up question. And mm -hmm. this one may be a little easier for you to answer. Which are the best parks or the best canyons that we talked about today that are most easily accessible and that you can see things without doing a big hike without, you know, either drive bys or close to the parking lots. Yeah. Um, Grand Canyon for sure. Um, because it is such high visitation. You can see some of those photographs. A lot of those photographs actually were taken just right from the rim, literally stepping out of my car on a paved path, you know, not a big hike. Um, you know, play around with the settings and stuff sometimes, but um, uh, uh, so certainly the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, Arches is is fairly accessible. Um, there's there's some places where it's a little gravelly, or you might have a few steps, but you can actually get up close and personal, uh, right in the heart of the park with some of those arches. And that's that's one of the advantages about a national park, right? There is a little more infrastructure than as opposed to some of the wilderness areas that I was mentioning earlier. Um, that I love to revisit. Um, uh, and, and I would say Zion as well. So the town of Springdale is right up against the edge of the park and it's um, very easy to navigate. There's lots of infrastructure there. It's all um, ADA accessible. Um, you can easily get on the shuttle buses with chairs or limited mobility, um, take the shuttle through. You can stop and get off and on as many times as you like. And really, you know, anywhere that you get off, it's not going to be ugly, <laughs> you know, right. anywhere that you get off, you can sit by a little creek and just wait for the, you know, wait for a couple of shuttle buses to go by and hop back on when you want. Um, you know, nobody's, uh, nobody's punching your ticket or anything. Once you're in there, you're in there, um, uh, hanging out in front of the Zion Lodge and just looking up at the canyon walls is, is a really special yeah. uh, thing to do as well. 
That's awesome. So I, I think you are right. Um, the United States has done an amazing job of making our, um, you know, our landscape available to everybody. And I think that's really important for us to, to know too, you know, with accessibility um, questions in play, you want to make sure that this is open to everybody. So I, I think that's a good thing to take away. I, I am very excited for this tour. Um, it's, it's almost like a blessing for the pandemic. I'm a global traveler normally, so I don't stop and enjoy my own country often. And this year, not only am I going to the national parks, but also Alaska. So I'm really feeling pretty, pretty awesome. blessed to be able to see a lot of our country. So thank you for bringing this to us virtually. Um, I look forward to getting back with you in future virtual tours for more of the discovery of our national parks. And I hope everybody had a great night. Thank you for coming. Thank and you all I hope to see you so next much. week. Take care. Much appreciated.